Um, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the IFI, the Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs. Uh, my name is Nasir Yassin. I'm the Institute's Director of Research and I teach uh, Health Policy and Planning. Um, we're glad to have uh, our colleague from Denver, from University of Denver, Randall, Randall Kuhn. I'm just figuring out how to pronounce the name with Randall. <laughs> I will be talking on the human development and the Arab Spring five years on. And what Randall will, will try to answer today, um, is there a role for human development or in a way or another in the uprisings that uh, rocked the Arab world a few years back? And perhaps we'll try to get this also to the current experience uh, with the protests, the popular protests in Lebanon, whether this is in some ways related or not to human development. Randall, uh, just to briefly introduce you, um, he has a PhD in demography and sociology from University of Pennsylvania, and he's currently the director of uh, the Global Health Affairs Program at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies in Denver. Randall will have like half an hour, and then another half an hour or so of question and answer. Welcome to AUB. Before we start, uh, we, the talk will be uh, live tweeted, and the hashtag will be Hashtag Arab development, and you can always refer to us at as at IFI underscore AUB. Okay, Brenda, please. Um, before I start, I'm always uh, bad at uh, remembering to thank everybody, so I just wanted to start by thanking everyone uh, at IFI and AUB, uh, especially uh, Nasser Yassin, uh, my host, uh, Serene in the administrative office, and Farah, uh, Rabi, uh, Amir, and Michael in, on this amazing communications and tech team, uh, Carla Mahlouf and Hala Gades in the School of uh, Health Sciences who hosted me yesterday, uh, of course, the Ferris family for endowing this incredible center that really, this feels, although this is my first time in Beirut, it feels like a homecoming because my wife's family is from here and because I, I used so much of the material that came out of IFI before the Arab Spring, especially on youth in transition. So this feels like a uh, home for me. And of course, uh, thanks to uh, Dame Zaha Hadid for uh, this amazing building where we're all sitting. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, here's a photo that seems kind of, it's hard to even remember. For me, I remember very well uh, those, the coverage of the events at Tahrir Square. I remember sitting there, my little boy, Zeki, is about to turn five. And so I remember as we approached the fifth anniversary, sitting there glued to the television, holding him in my lap nervously and watching the coverage. But there have been a lot a lot has happened in the Arab world since then, and there have been a lot of protests from New Delhi to New York to Hong Kong. Uh, so it's easy to sort of lose track of the events of Tahrir. This image is a little bit harder for me to forget. The image of Mohammed Bouazizi, the Tunisian fruit vendor who set himself on fire, uh, initiating the spark that lit the Arab Spring. Um, and it was really the story, Bouazizi's story, the story that we first heard about him and the revisions to the story that really made me think about this connection between human development and the Arab Spring. The story we first heard, heard about Bouazizi was he was frustrated, he was a college graduate who was frustrated, who, had, who was reduced to selling fruit and he wasn't even allowed to do that by the corrupt local authorities. The real story was perhaps even more interesting and emblematic of the situation, was, which was that he had gone to high school, but he was a fruit vendor in order to put his sisters through college. And this is sort of, for me, encapsulates the incredible progress in human development that um, I'm going to describe in the first part of my talk before moving on to sort of where that human development did not lead and, and therefore led to the Arab Spring. Let me, I just want to start with a little bit about the human development paradigm, which uh, some of you are probably uh, well familiar with from your classes, but um, the idea, right, a lot of us in this room are connected to health sciences in some way, and we don't think that health needs to lead to something to be valuable, right? Health is a right, 
Health is a good in its own right. Health doesn't need to lead to development or peace or security or economic growth for it to be a good thing and for it to be a right. And nevertheless, uh, scholars like Amartya Sen have emphasized the important role of human development, of basic human development in a constellation of human capabilities that at least in our minds are the ingredients to a just, productive, uh, and peaceful society. Um, a lot of this does go back to growth and productivity and to the work of uh, the Nobel, another Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, Robert Fogel, who, whose theory of the techno-physio evolution basically argued that the change, using data, amazing historical data from the United States, basically argued that the change in the bodies, the nutrition, the freedom from disease of Americans after the Civil War was essentially the engine that drove America's miraculous development, uh, along with you know, control of the high seas and unlimited natural resources, of course. But that a big contributor of that, if you look, say, at why America did so much better than Brazil, for instance, uh, began with the, 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 our bo the bodies of people in the society being the engines of development, they increase productivity and in turn, institutions, economies, governance, technology evolve to put those human skills, human capabilities to use. The counter argument from a future Nobel Prize winner, I guess, Darren Achimoglu, is that in fact in the modern time, although we have these stories from the US and the UK historically, and we have a few examples like South Korea of countries where health was followed by development, for the most part the evidence in the post-World War II era is not terribly strong that health leads to development. And that's fundamentally because if you improve health but institutions and infrastructure and markets remain unchanged, then not much is going to happen. And so what the Arab Spring brought to my mind, thinking about, I had already written on the incredible human development progress that the Arab states had seen between, say, 1980 uh, and 2000, that if you have this exceptional progress in human development and it is not met with institutional changes that harness that, will the human development in turn lead to a demand by the public, right? If you can't harness our, our skills, our capabilities, will there be a demand for change? And is that part of the story of the Arab Spring? And so I'm gonna run through three basic mechanisms that I wanna talk about. And again, a lot of this is really food for thought that really needs to be tested going forward. These are hard questions that require careful thought about how you would answer these questions qualitatively, using qualitative research, quantitative historical research, and it's really for students of today to think about the interesting ways to address these issues. But we have three basic pathways. The big one that I want to focus on today is rising and unmet popular expectations, demands for that as the process of development continued, uh, the public, the needs of the population became more intensive and more complex, thereby requiring a more subtle and capable government response, and one that a number of the autocratic regimes in the area, in the region, were not capable of achieving. Second, that um, a more basic proposition, that human development created opportunities for political engagement by giving people the means of using new technologies that were just coming online at the time. And third, a, a, a more subtle distinction, that, there was, was, that the rise in expectations constituted not just a gradual ratcheting up of here's the next thing I want, here's the next thing I want, but a more fundamental change in the values uh, and, and a more fundamental demand, a, a need for a new social contract. So I want to describe a little bit the human development progress that I, as I see it in the Arab states over the la last 30 years, then describe the pathway from human development to political mobilization. And then five years on, I do want to take a quick look 
at some recent trends focusing on the issue of marriage as a very important uh, human life outcome and one that has gained a lot of publicity as being a challenging life outcome in the Arab states. I want to look at some data from the GCC countries that managed to avoid the Arab Spring or managed to avoid the uprisings. Just as a disclaimer, this framework that I'm offering is by no means intended to explain the exact timing of the Arab Spring, uh, nor is it intended to replace other explanations. So explanations relating to, relating to popular and social media um, or relating to the recession certainly matter. But I do want to, I guess what I, what I hope to do is put, uh, I, I almost want to say a more positive spin, that, to, that we should be focusing as much on the capabilities and the advantages that drove the uprisings as the disadvantages and the crises. Um, so it's a bit of an alternate narrative that I welcome people to critique and refine in this room and you know, feel free to email me. Uh, so our story begins with uh, these four uh, partners in uh, 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 crime and investing in uh, basic human development. Um, it's not a new concept. That ought, it's becoming more and more accepted in the literature on health on global health, that autocracies do have certain skill sets that make them, and we want to be very careful about this, that make them better suited to certain aspects of basic human development. As an example, I live in Boulder, Colorado, which is like the epicenter of the vaccine rejection movement in my country. Right? In America, democracy means if all my neighbors, the, my children's classmates, and Donald Trump getting on TV and saying what is scientifically wrong, don't, take, don't accept your immunizations, there's no problem, it's all just for you. Gaddafi, Mubarak, Ben Ali would not, right, it was not in their skill set to tolerate any kind of opposition to uh, something like a mass immunization campaign. So the mass component of an immunization campaign, the collective aspect, the fact that there was not much room for interaction with the public makes immunizations a perfect example and perhaps the extreme of an example of a program that autocrats would be good at but immunizations are also a major driver of human development alone. They're responsible for a great deal of change. And again, this idea of the autocrat as the driver of human development gains is not unique to the Arab world. So these uh, fellows were preceded a decade by Augusto Pinochet in Chile uh, uh, and by Park Chung-hee in South Korea in the 1960s and 70s. So this notion is increasing well increasingly well established, and we can see it in the numbers. So Libya, a relatively oil-rich autocracy, but also Egypt, a relatively poor autocracy, speeding ahead of democratic India in terms of infant mortality over a relatively short time and closing the gap with a nation like the United States, which had a big lead. And one of the things I want to emphasize here is not just that some people were doing better in the Arab states. I really do want to emphasize the universality of the basic human development gains while recognizing there were many minority groups, many rural or urban slum populations, and of course women and other disadvantaged groups who were not keeping up on certain indicators. If you look at an indicator like uh, infant mortality, what you see is, a, this is for Egypt, from demographic and health surveys, you see a disappearing gap between Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, and the urban areas. You see a disappearing gap in terms of maternal schooling. And I don't even need to graph the gender differences in, child morta in infant mortality, since they had already disappeared, by, for the most part, by 1988. So this is, uh, again, an achievement of a kind. And, and I don't mean to say that it's not necessarily that citizens traded their opportunity to say no to the ruling regimes for these benefits. It's simply that there was an autocratic regime, there were autocratic regimes that provided these benefits in part to establish their authority. These advantages carried on into the future. 
And I just want to preface this graph by saying, I, I gave a TED talk a couple years ago, and the graphic designers do some, this is a really good example of kind of how to lie with, not how to lie with statistics, but this graph shows, right, women, this is from s demographic and health surveys from the region for selected birth cohorts. And what you see are women in, in the average sub-Saharan African sample dropping in height, while women in the Arab states are rising. And this graph makes it look like women in the Arab states are becoming giants. Um, in fact, uh, it's like a three, four centimeter gain, which, and, and again, height in this case, wh when we talk about height, what we're really talking about is a good indicator of stunting, uh, right? That if people, if, if a society is composed of individuals who do or don't, achieve their potential height if they weren't exposed to an excruciating burden of undernutrition and infectious disease in childhood. If nobody were stunted, the average height would rise, and that's what we're picking up in this trajectory. So, healthier to start with those benefits carrying forward into right, height, this higher average height is undoubtedly reflected in Higher level in higher levels of security, potentially in uh, evidence would suggest in cognition, in non-cognitive aspects of self-presentation, a whole manner of capabilities would would have been on the rise, and all of this would be reflected in the fact that by the time of the eve of the Arab Spring, people in the Arab states could take for granted even the average person, forgetting say the middle class. Even the average person could take for granted a long life, whether it was a healthy life or a productive life, we can say it was a long life as evidenced by this figure that suggests that based on life tables at the time from the World Health Organization, a 15-year-old woman living in Tunisia would have a lower probability of dying before her 60th birthday than an American woman. Um, now obviously the United States has a fair amount of uh, heterogeneity. Uh, by, by race and socioeconomic status. And Tunisian men would have had a much higher probability of dying because of smoking. But still, this is pretty exceptional, right? What we're seeing is a shift from a, an unhealthy start and an uncertain future to a healthy start, right? Healthier and expecting a longer life. And when you expect a longer life, we know you can start taking for granted things like, if I know I'm going to die, if I think I'm gonna die next month, I might as well do whatever, right? I could, I could take drugs, I could not go to, why would I bother going to school or getting a master's degree, right? A whole range of life choices start to change. Everything can be forward looking. You can wait to get married till you're 30. You can wait for that better job simply if you know that you have a longer life in store. This then is reflected in the amazing progress in university enrollment, in, in, in university enrollment, uh, you know, and Libya was of course an extreme example. Uh, the rise in university enrollment was uh, both enabled by progress, in the preceding progress in human development, um, and of course by government uh, grants to make college cheaper, and of course by government promises of employment for people who graduated college. So to some extent, that was being dragged up. But this is where we leave things. This is where the story sort of changes, right? You have what I would call a golden generation. In some ways, it's the generation that just preceded maybe the, the, most of the people, the young people in this room. The, fir, the largest cohorts that the Arab, most of the Arab states would ever see, um, healthier than any group that had ever come before at the start, expecting longer lives, better educated, expecting a bright future, represented in the media by Noor. Uh, no, by other, by representations in the popular media, in civil society, in private spaces, in consumption patterns, of an image of a particular kind of life that was available to all, right? And so what I wanna emphasize is not just your own health, being better, your own personal physical security being better, but it's everyone around you, right? So the fact that you're healthier, your family are healthier, your neighbors are healthier, and that people across this shared space of the connected by language and culture, that, that people were healthier, in, in my argument, created a sense 
of expectation that things would continue going this way. And, and, and again, my argument would be that with what happened next, when the, when the opportunities stopped, right, in many cases, in many historical contexts, people have stopped and settled, right? They've, been, they've gotten, they've, they've, they've had a bright, they thought they had a bright future, and then they saw that they didn't. And they retreated into the informal labor market. They accepted whatever marriage they could get. And that's not what happened in the Arab world. So what happened in the Arab world is this notion of weighthood. How many people are familiar with the term weighthood? As a concept, okay, that's good. That's in certain rooms uh, on this trip. That's been like weighthood is the word that everyone uses. So weighthood is the notion of it's not quite adulthood. It's not quite childhood. You should be heading into adulthood, but instead you're waiting. You're waiting for the perfect job so that you can get the perfect marriage. So for a man, this could be I'm waiting for. I need that job so I can get an apartment to lure a great wife. But the longer I stay. Uh, the longer I stay jobless and unmarried, the kind of weirder I become. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> and for women, uh, and, and again, this would manifest itself differently at different levels of, uh, of the class hierarchy. So a, a lot of great work was conducted uh, by my colleague Sajida Amin and others in Egypt looking at the sort of trap that lower middle class women in Egypt may have been faced with, which is you need uh, to raise money to, a, a woman needs to raise money to pay for wedding costs, but the more she works, the more, your, the more her dowry goes up, or the, the more the cost of getting married goes up. And so uh, you're, you're in a bit of a trap. Um, but what I want to be clear about is, I don't want to say that people chose to be in this trap, right? The, the, this kind of trap was a product of many forces, right? The promise of employment by the government that wasn't there. The expectations, right? When I talk about a golden generation, I don't want to put the Arab Spring just on that generation, right? Because in a sense, the hopes of whole nations, right? You're, if you were part of this golden generation, your parents, your future siblings, your future children, your current siblings, were all looking to you to carry the mantle forward for society. And so some of it may have been pressure, some, but some of it, in my mind, uh, and, and based on the reading of a lot of, of sort of narrative accounts of this story is that people were, I don't want to say optimistic, but irrepressible, perhaps, in looking towards the future, in, in accepting this notion that you could wait, that waiting wasn't a bad thing because there was a bright future um, to... Uh, there's my little guy. There's my, there's my bright future. My family just walked in. <laughs> um, that there was really an opportunity to, cre to create enormous change. Uh, and, and that people could have settled. In many contexts, they would have settled, but they didn't. So here's just one uh, illustrative graph. So this is one of the things that we want to be clear about with the sort of the crisis of, <laughs> hi, the crisis of underemployment uh, in the Arab states is that any society undergoing this transition toward, right, any society that has, hello. <laughs> Hi, guys. Any society that has a rapid increase in longevity will experience this shift, right? This is part of the process. If you're living longer lives, if you have greater opportunities to attend school, you're going to, <laughs> you're, you're going, to be le you're going to be more likely at, at a certain age. So this is the ratio. I'm going to step up for a second. This is a, a little bit of a complicated graph. This is the ratio of youth employment to the uh, employment rates of the rest of the population. And so what you see is that as societies go through this transition towards better health and better longevity, they will naturally have a much lower percentage of their population in the labor market, right? They will be at university. What you, and so this is, to some extent, the crisis of employment in the Arab states at that particular time was just a transitional phenomenon that any society, Korea faced it, Singapore faced it, Chile, Argentina, all these societies faced it. But there was something else going on to a certain extent, which is that you see a number of Arab states below this line so that people were holding out for longer, waiting for the better job. 
Um, and again, this is most obvious in the trends on marriage. So I don't know how many people are familiar with this graph. This is the mean age at marriage uh, for Tunisia from 1975 to 2004. Um, and, uh, and I think it's pretty widely publicized that the uh, countries of the Maghreb had rising male age at marriage. What I think is a little bit more surprising is the rising female age at marriage that was moving essentially in lockstep with the male age at marriage. And, and we know uh, this means, uh, right, in Tunisia and, uh, and Algeria and Morocco, you also saw a rising rate of a, a rising share of the population not getting married at all. Um, and again, this is not, I don't get married, I stay in an apartment, I work, I play the field. This is, I'm living in my parents' home, again, working potentially to raise money for my own marriage. That may never happen. Um, and so this, in a sense, was a trap. That, uh, again, a trap that it was, that, that was largely a product of opportunities and expectations. And so I... I choose to frame it, I, I, what I want to emphasize is that we can think of it as a crisis and a trap, but it was also a reflection of a positive, a, a high level of expectation in the population. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Is that connected? Oh. I see. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. Um, so. The, the next thing I want to move to then is data on political participation and engagement. And there's not that much data here, especially what we really need, what I want to you know, emphasize is we need more data that links political participation, political attitudes, political values to actual measures of human development. Uh, a lot of people involved with the World Values Survey come through this building and do amazing work. And the World Values Survey is an incredible resource, but it lacks a lot of the social covariates that we might want to see, like measures of health, measures of poverty, measures of, of a, a, a more nuanced measure of education. Um, we know that the Arab states saw relatively low levels of voting and civic participation compared to other regions of the world, but then we know that, you know, why would you have voted? Why would, a, why would an educated person have voted in an Egyptian election uh, b before the Arab Spring? There wouldn't, that, that might be a mark of, uh, intelligence. Throughout the region before the Arab Spring, there was a high level of support for democracy. Universal, right? Countries that had uprisings, countries that didn't have uprisings. So that basic expression of support for democracy doesn't really tell us very much either about what was going on. But so there, what we can learn a little bit more from is data on support for the specifics of democracy. So one question that the World Values Survey includes, it's a set of questions where basically you're asked to rank in order, how do these four things fit in your personal priority? Maintain order in the nation, give people more say in government decisions, fight rising prices, protect freedom of speech. So basically, if you're A and C, you're materialist, you're focusing on basic security needs. If you're B and D as the top two, you're focused on more on broader societal needs. And of course, a lot of people would be admit, wouldn't use those exact rankings. So it really shows people who are at the, the edges. They have a strong, mostly concerned about prices and security, or mostly concerned about voice and rights. And what we see, so this is a graph for a number of regions, we see this relationship between the decline of infant mortality in one era, in one, at, at the time of your birth, and a shift, a pretty dramatic shift, especially notable in Egypt, towards uh, people answering that yes, their, great, their strongest commitment is towards popular voice. So this takes us away, it's easy to say, I want democracy. It's a little bit harder to say, right? This is hard, especially during a recession. It's hard for any of us to say, I care more about popular voice and human rights than I do about prices and security. So, right? So for people, and th again, these data come from before the Arab Spring, before the recession. But right, it's easier to say those things, again, if you feel secure physically, economically, and if, you've, and if everyone around you is sharing those characteristics. The last thing I just want to throw out is 
Evidence, and this comes from uh, Amani Jamal, who spends a fair amount of time here at IFI, um, on the relative odds of ever engaging in political protest prior to the Arab Spring. And one of the interesting things that we see is if you look at an interaction between education and employment, right, the story of the Arab Spring would be, oh, all these people were educated, they were disappointed, and they didn't get what they want, and so they went out and protested. That's not what this graph shows. What this graph shows is the group that was most likely to protest were the educated and employed. Now, this may be because they had government jobs that didn't require them to be at their desk, so they could be out protesting. But still, they could have been doing a million other things. I know how busy people are, right? Uh, there's a million other things they could have been doing with their time other than protesting against the government, but what greater expression of optimism about the future could you have than people who have a job, who have education, uh, going out and protesting, demanding, right, again, demanding a new social contract. So, this just sort of sums things up, sums things up. Uh, again, after five years after the Arab Spring, uh, it can seem like all we have left to remember it by is this uh, beautiful postage stamp honoring uh, Mohammed Bouazizi. But there's been progress in a lot of places. We know there's a reform process going on in Morocco, in Jordan. Uh, there are obviously interesting things happening in Lebanon right now. Um, and, and the basic story remains unchanged. The Arab states saw near universal human development progress on basic indicators, dissatisfaction, and in the paper I go through a lot of different examples, not just those relating to employment and marriage. That dissatisfaction emerged from a higher level of expectation of, of service from government and a changing set of political values, more towards universal needs. Um, the actual uprisings were, of course, enabled by many, many other forces, and, of course, the uprisings were averted in a number of countries, like the Gulf monarchies, um, through a combination of cracking down on dissent and offering subsidies, right? So we know the, the member states of the Gulf Cooperation Council, including Bahrain, which had a major uprising, all use some combination of, re of, uh, of repression and incentives to the population to uh, avert their uprisings. And if my story is in any way correct, what you would expect to see is that any money that, say, Saudi Arabia pours into their economy to avert a revolution would simply be adding to the bubble of expectations that would come going forward. That 130, million, 130 billion dollars in subsidies would buy off some dissent now, but would, would continue inflating the bubble of expectations going forward. It would say, raise the price of marriage, uh, raise people's expectations for employment, whatever it is that they were giving. Um, so I wanted to go back and look a little bit at what went on in the Gulf states. And I should preface this by saying, by far the most important thing that's going on, in my mind, in the Arab states right now, is the war in Syria. And I have nothing to say. I have nothing to add to what many, many people who work in this building and pass through this building have to say about Syria. So I, I'm not talking about Syria, uh, but it's there in my mind. I would have liked to have uh, thought about the situation in Lebanon, but as you see, most of the story that I'm telling is based on indicator data. And Lebanon, you know, has a certain shortage of data. Uh, in the absence of a census, in the absence of a vital registration system, there aren't many, especially real-time data for the last five years that I can draw for Lebanon. Um, so the GCC states offer, uh, some of them actually have very impressive demographic registration systems that provide close to real-time data on what's going on. I tried, when I went to look at the magnitude of the subsidies that the Gulf states gave to their populations, I was actually surprised at how hard it was to pin down exactly how big the subsidies were. It's not like right, they were these packages of services. It was never a specific dollar amount. Saudi Arabia saved $130 billion. But it's hard to even look in Saudi Arabia's accounts and see there's not like a big spike of $130 billion because all their budgets were increasing due to the rising price of oil. So I tried to qualitatively characterize right, that what you have here is pretty large subsidies as a percent of GDP 
in Oman, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. The three Gulf states that have where nationals compose a half or more of the population. And relatively smaller subsidies, like the UAE seemingly didn't care at all, right? They, they gave almost no subsidies after the Arab Spring. It was just business as usual. Now, here is a graph of the crude marriage rate. So again, these are rough data. There's not much data out there on these issues that we can get to really keep tabs on the situation in real time. But all of the Gulf states provide data on, mar on number of marriages, and countries like Bahrain with civil registration systems actually provide good data on age of marriage. What we see here is a familiar trend of declining, this is where I should use the, right, declining rate of marriage. And again, the decline in the rate of marriage in the Gulf states is fast. It's faster than the decline in the United States in, say, the 1970s and 1980s. A fast decline in age of marriage going into 2010, and then what you'd expect, if you dump a bunch of money into the economy, you're going to get people are going to say, okay, now's a good time to get married. Free apartment, free jo extra jobs, I'll get married. That's my timer going off, that's good, I'm almost done. And then, but then what we see here is interesting. As the subsidies taper off, the marriage spike disappears, right? Countries go right back to their trend. Whatever money has been added to the economy is absorbed, potentially priced back into the marriage, right? There's a bunch of extra marriages, then the price of, as with any good product, the price of a marriage would rise, and the marriage rate would start to drop back, go right back onto this trend of declining marriage. This is even more clear. Thank you, thank you, Bach, for having a, a high quality demographic registration system that allows us not just to see, is anyone here from Bahrain? Bravo, good system. Uh, <laughs> so here you see, this is, we actually can construct an average age at marriage. This is the age at marriage for the people who currently got married this year, which could mean, who? This could mean more young people, or if the age at marriage is dropping, as it did in 2011, that could mean more young people are getting married, or it could mean that fewer old people are getting married. I went into the data and looked, and it's pretty clearly what was happening is more young people we're getting married, right? That during this spike, exactly what we would expect would happen. In a society where people are delaying marriage more and more, when a bunch of money was pumped into the economy, people took the opportunity to get married younger for that one year, and then they went right back onto their trend of rising, right, declining marriage, rising age at marriage. In the United Arab Emirates, where increasingly they're not really united, they actually have separate data systems in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, you see no stimulus and just an unabated decline in marriage, right? That, uh, and and you, know, you look at the press, like the National and other papers from the UAE, you get a story on the exceptional price of marriage and the impossibility of getting married seemingly every week. Um, uh, again, divorce is also part of this equation. So for uh, Qatar um, and Kuwait, to some extent, the, right, in some countries you have a decline in marriage, in some you have a mix of less decline in marriage but a rise in divorce. Um, and the basic point is, I'll go back on that, right, that again, this, these are not, the, we don't have the, it, it's hard to get real time statistics on people's attitudes. And it's even hard to get real time statistics on people's kind of life outcomes. But this is something that gets us fairly close. And I encourage, for students who are looking for a neat opportunity, use innovative data. Surveys are great, national indicators are great, but think about using some of these uh, demographic registration systems that provide really interesting breakouts for sub-regions of countries um, and for national indicators. But what seems to be happening, right, is that the decline, right, that the subsidies went into the economy and then were quickly processed through. And that the basic situation, again, Marriage being one example of a basic process of rising expectation and a greater and greater difficulty for society to meet those expectations continue. And just a bit about, you know, the, the point of the marriage, of talking about marriage, it's not that, right, marriage, the, the marriage crisis is interesting because it reflects a big set of aspirations, right? Marriage, what's interesting about marriage is it should be fine if, if only 90% of the population get married, 
or 80%. That should be fine. That happens in a lot of societies. The problem, of course, in, the, in a lot of societies is that marriage is the only pathway to achieving adulthood. And a good marriage is the only pathway to achieving a good adulthood. And that matters differently for men and women, right? For men, the only pathway to achieving a high status in society is through the timing and quality of marriage. And for a woman, achieving you know, even the basic opportunities of citizenship in the Gulf states potentially involves ha getting married and having children. So if right, what's interesting uh, about looking at marriage is that, of course, it's tied to all these things like housing and loans and cars and all the things you supposedly need to get married. Um, but also that the, ref right, the solution to a marriage crunch like this is not to make marriage cheaper. Because what this would say is if you give people money, if you subsidize their housing or promise them jobs, it will just be priced right into the marriage market. What really needs to be happening is a, a society is taking a hard look at how they treat marriage, how men and women are, are, are viewed as parties to a marriage, and what, what, why does society place such a big value on marriage. One last interesting slide. Uh, Tunisia just finished the, producing the results for their 2014 census. And in 2010, it looked like Tunisia was on the way to an even sharper increase in age of marriage. Over the last five years, it actually flattened out quite a bit. Rates of marriage have been rising. Crude marriage rates have been rising for five years in Tunisia. And now, in the current census, the mean age of marriage has barely moved up. So now that doesn't mean that Tunisia, somehow by having a democracy that's still a work in progress, has dramatically transformed people's lives and, and brought justice and allowed pe uh, families to uh, form in a earlier, but, but it is a reflection of um, that there are things happening, right? That there are changes happening uh, in Asia and again in other places like Morocco. Um, the question that I came into this talk with uh, is, is the real Arab Spring still coming, especially to the Gulf states? Or perhaps people have a question in their minds for here in Lebanon right now. I think a lot of people believe this. Um, I'm not sure. Again, all I want to say is I think the same things that were driving the Arab Spring in a place like Tunisia are continuing, to, uh, 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 con are continuing or accelerating in the Gulf as we speak today. As concerned academics or future scholars, our focus should not be on sitting around waiting to be proven right. It should be on thinking our, on, about what are the policies, what are the reforms that would be needed for societies to achieve a, a, a more just set of human development outcomes uh, while not uh, having, again, no matter, one of the things we learned from the Arab Spring is no matter how nonviolent the revolution is at the start, there's always the possibility for uh, really, really bad outcomes. And I, I think uh, Syria, you know, the situation in Syria continues to uh, unfold in very troubling ways, uh, certainly. A lot of people in this room are affected directly in a variety of ways by the situation in Syria. And I think there are many opportunities through policy, uh, many ideas that are being championed by IFI and people in this room to, uh, to develop a set of social reforms that can meet people's needs and uh, bring justice and uh, bring better governance uh, to the region. So thank you all for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Thank you very much. That was uh, extremely interesting. Um, we'll uh, go straight to question and answer. So we'll open the floor for three questions at a time. We'll get then another round. So uh, we have our colleagues on the sides with the microphone. Uh, just before asking, uh, introduce yourself um, and your affiliation, but also be uh, straight as a question and not a long commentary, okay? So we'll start with our colleague over there. Please, okay. Thank you, doctor. I have to say that this uh, presentation is, in my humble opinion, uh, my name is Nadim Haider. I'm a graduate student in uh, Middle Eastern Studies in AUB. 
I found this to be a complete rehash of modernization theory, Asimoglu. I mean, it's just the same old story, right? Let's start. You didn't really explain why human development was going up in the 1980s up until now. You just said it was a fact. I don't really understand why this was the case. Now, this implies that the neoliberal policies, which were implied in the 1980s from on, were the more or less the cause of the rising human development. While at the same time, this was rising income disparities, and what most people consider the leading cause of the Arab Spring is these neoliberal policies. I have to also remind you, just because something is better doesn't mean it's good. Slavery was much better in the 18th century than it was in the 16th century. No one would argue, therefore, slavery is good. In that same way, even if you show me some positives, you're not accounting for all the opportunity costs that would ha we could have achieved had we not had some these policies, had the oil been used in a different way, et cetera, et cetera. Two, um, this issue of changing values. I mean, it's assuming that somehow in the past, we didn't have those values of democracy, of justice, of equality, when since the 1920s, people have been revolting and revolting for these same demands and for these same expectations. So this idea that modernization brought in new expectations and you know somehow changed us and it, it strips, of, it strips us of agency, it's all about you know coming from the outside, we just uh, ref react to this situation when we have constantly been showing to the West, to the colonizing powers, to our own de despots and tyrants, these things have always been there. Um, the issue of health leading to development is more or less a correlation that negates and reduces, it's a tot utterly reductionist analysis, which doesn't account for colonization, imperialism, etc. And when you say, I'm not trying to replace this uh, narrative, I'm giving a, an alternative one, that's a nice way of masking and, I mean, by very definition, you're focusing on these variables, which by definition omit and mask other variables. Um, so this idea of rising expectations is once again a rehash of this mod modernity tradition. We are traditional, modernity came in, just in a new, new language, nice statistics, but I, I just, I still feel it's ridden with Huntingtonian modernization uh, elements. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, no class struggle, none of that, right? Not the H word, Huntingtonian. Okay. <laughs> um, have Orgudi here, please. Dr. Anja Fenosa, Sociology of Education. But I, I just want to know uh, your uh, opinion regarding Lebanon. Now we are uh, uh, facing a, uh, 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 the demands of the people regarding uh, social justice. So, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, you uh, in what you can help us as your opinion, your experience, because you, you studied all the, the Gulf co countries and the, most of the Arab countries. Thank you. Okay, let's have another one. Any other question? No? Okay. So, Randall. I think I'm, I'm still mic'd here. Yeah. Can I switch to this one? Is that off? Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Um, on the question about modernization theory, revolts have been going on for a long, well, first of all, revolts have been going on for a long time. This one was different, and the one that is still coming uh, will be different still. Um, modernization is something, I think we can, Modernization was, in a sense, a collection of good ideas that were packaged into a horrible causal framework, right? The idea, modernization theory basically said a bunch of good things will happen and will be followed by a bunch of other good things. I'm trying to say something more specific and hopefully more analytically useful, which is that if you specifically target good things towards people, enabling them to be free from certain forms of deprivation, then they can make choices for themselves. And that a bridge or a financial liberalization or solidaire or something like that does not achieve that uh, end. That does not begin to touch the other things that people would need to get uh, uh, to where they need to be. But, but I want to be, be clear on that, that this is like modernization, except I, I, I want 
to focus it squarely on people's capabilities. And if it turns out that people always had the freedom from, that people were always capable of protesting and standing up for themselves in spite of their physical insecurity and their physical vulnerability and their hunger, frankly. I don't think that's what the evidence bears out. But if, if that were the case, uh, 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 especially globe, globe. Well. Nineteen twenty Syria, nineteen twenty Morocco, nineteen twenty five Syria, nineteen forty, nineteen nineteen Egypt. I can go on. Nineteen forty five Syria. All the anti colonial struggles in the nineteen fifties. I mean, we can go on and on of the struggles. It's a continuous struggle. It's always been there. It's a class struggle. This is just to say suddenly, this is suddenly new. The Arab Spring started by Bouazizi's burning. No, it, it happened from a long history of class struggle, a long, long one, which finally, finally, thank God, destroyed these regimes. Yeah. But well, except yeah. the one in That's, Egypt came back. <laughs> but, yeah, right. I mean, um, so, <laughs> so right. It, it, in any case, right. I, I think the goal, as I said, uh, the goal is not to replace nor to subtly replace. It's simply to say that when people when people have the freedom to, uh, again, hunger, hunger can give you a motivation. There's no motivation for toppling a regime like hunger. It's just when you're hungry, it is really hard, easy to get distracted. Uh, again, the example that I used, uh, it, it's a pretty simple example, but the, the juxtaposition that I used in earlier versions of this talk is Gaddafi versus Kim Jong-il. Right, these guys had very similar approaches to governance, to nuclear weapons dabbling. They both had uh, very unique wardrobes. Gaddafi did things that Kim Jong Il did not do. One of them died in his sleep, and one of them did not. Um, now, uh, on the on the question of Lebanon, I I do not I do not know that I can give a really good answer to that. Uh, I think clearly you can see, I mean, what I said, uh, with the, if we take the situation with the garbage crisis as a particular example, what I can say is that the garbage crisis is both the same crisis that has been unfolding uh, since the 1970s and the 1980s, right? It's always a crisis about something that relates to the governance situation here, that relates to the difficult conditions of uh, ruling and governing this society that have to relate uh, to the Israeli invasion uh, and occupation, uh, to the very difficult situation in the region. That being said, although the basic kind of problems stay the same, the specifics of the problems do change in interesting ways. So if we take garbage as a basic concept, as garbage as a thing in development, we can say that the garbage situation in Lebanon, the garbage itself has changed in Lebanon. Relative to 20 years ago, Lebanon has more garbage as a function of human development and aspiration. It is a different kind of garbage. It is garbage, there's more plastic involved that doesn't go anywhere when you dispose of it. There's a conversation about recycling mixed in with the garbage situation. And at the same time, there are communities that don't want to be sitting on garbage anymore. And so those are genuine changes. So right within this basic same situation over and over again repeating itself, we can say the garbage crisis is different because the garbage has changed and the people's expectations regarding garbage have changed. And, it, and, and undoubtedly, uh, and, and although the protesters are talking about a broader range of issues than garbage, right, people come with the issue that is in front of them. And so the fact that this is a different issue than a garbage crisis 10 years ago would have been matters, right? This is the, that a government that is serious about staying in power needs to keep in mind that this is going to be harder, right? And, and as I understand the situation, three years passed with no, that there was a three-year window to resolve, three years? 
to resolve the garbage crisis and nothing was done, uh, in part because no one appreciated the complexity of it. And, and so the rising complexity of governance challenges, that matters. That said, I think that it's a long way from, right, the political parties here do not seem to be terribly interested in these particular protests, and that matters. But it will be interesting to see what happens, and I look forward to keep following it. Okay, great. Let's have another round. Uh, I see our colleagues, our colleague over there. Just introduce yourself and direct focus question, please. Uh, my name is Mo'ayyad. I am a student here at AUB. First of all, I'd just like to point out that I have no interest in uh, trying to antagonize our guest who is here to offer nuance analysis and replace his analysis with neo-Arab Marxist pamphleteer rhetoric. Um, <laughs> I have some very direct questions that I hope you can answer from your experience with research and so on. Uh, first of all, uh, seeing how the disparity between uh, expectations and uh, human development outcomes, the disparity being immense produced immense grievances. Could non-oil producing Arab states have curbed these grievances or take the, uh, the responsibility of providing beyond basic human development for these populations taken into account population growth and so on. Uh, another question is about subsidies. You mentioned Ar Arab monarchies try to avert the wave of uprisings through subsidies. Um, did others try another approach, you know, see, for example, uh, political reforms or constitutional reforms? Um, for example, two monarchies that you left out were Jordan and Morocco from that analysis. Um, um, an the other question is about economic policy and whether or not uh, statist or, or, or centralized socialist economic policy making was different from, from neoliberal or however you want to call it, market regulated in the region, did that correlate at all, or the same variables apply as to be in both cases? Thank you. Do you have other, any other question? Yeah, please. Uh, Tony Ayrut, uh, I'm a lawyer. My question is regarding the data that indicate what happened to the uh, level of human development in some countries that were affected by civil war as a consequence of uh, uh, the Arab upstream. Did you actually focus on Libya, on Egypt, I, and because only on the graphs that you showed were the number that were stabilized and didn't actually go down. Can you give us more information about the country where the human development went uh, more uh, in, in, down? In crisis, yeah. Okay. I think... Okay. I think on that last question about the other countries that actually had uprisings, I did not focus on this. Uh, Dr. Yassin was actually part of a panel that I think uh, the group, the, the Lancet group, yeah. that looked at some of these issues. And I think for the most part, it's right, there's been some damage to health systems, uh, but it, it's really too early to tell uh, what's going on with indicators. It seems like Tunisia's, you know, seen some helpful reforms. Egypt's been through uh, quite a difficult uh, period. And of course, it's a small sample of countries. So uh, that's why I, I, with the types, uh, because I have a particular approach in this regard of, of looking at w the data that are available, this is why it was really useful to focus on the GCC countries on this particular question of what's going to happen in these countries. But right, the, the questions, but we have a lot of questions about the countries that have, have had a revolution or a counter-revolution, and of course, uh, uh, about Syria. Um, on the, the previous set of uh, um, questions, um, what was the disparity, what was the disparity between expectation? I thought I had enough notes. It was a disparity between... Oh, right. Yes. This was actually a really interesting conversation that uh, Nasser and I were having before about the Arab Human Development Reports. Uh, and this is what I really want to highlight. There were, I, I, the, the Arab states have an incredibly rich history of protest and, and in a sense, a, a different, um, uh, right, a more straightforward approach to facing challenges of governance over the years 
Um, but there's not been as much of an, a, a, a focus on development and, uh, as a sort of technical pursuit. And the Arab human development reports that came out uh, in the last decade were, were quite amazing because they were basically, they were these reports that documented all of the progress that I was talking about, but they didn't dwell on like, let's celebrate this progress. They were basically warning shots. They came out aggressively year after year, one on gender, one on youth, one on justice, telling Arab states, regimes in the region, exactly what is wrong. Here's what you've done right. Here's what you've done wrong. Wake up and respond. If the Mubarak regime had read the first and second and third Arab development reports in 2004 through 2006 and come up with a set of reforms that, uh, the answer is I don't know. I really, I mean, I, I think it would have been very hard for them because I don't think it would have been in their nature, first of all. Second, I do think the U.S. and other donors might not have been that interested in, so if they'd come with a vision of social justice and inclusive development, it's not at all clear that American or European or other donors would have been on board with that vision. Um, but more to the point, I don't think they were paying attention at all. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's, I'm not even sure these regimes could have been up to the challenge, but I know for sure that they weren't even looking into it. Um, on the issue of subsidies, uh, one thing I think that's interesting and sort of illustrative of the situation that I'm talking about, and I bring this up in the paper, is that Egypt, you know, the classic move in Egypt to suppress a rebellion is to cut off the bread, the Baladi bread lines, the uh, bread shops that are run by the army. And the Mubarak regime did this in the Arab Spring. And this is what I argue is different. Ten years earlier, when there were, uh, when there were protests, the regime cut off the bread and the, and the protests stopped. This time, they cut off the bread, and it just made people angrier. Um, and that that is a change. That is the mm -hmm. government accounting for a smaller share of society's function. It's also about the government accounting for a smaller share of people's diet, right? That there was a time at which that bread was people's main source of food. That was not the case in Egypt in 2010, and that is a very different situation. And, and so that makes it quite a bit hard. It's, it's hard for a regime like Egypt's or Morocco's to muster the size of a subsidy to cut off rebellion. And so as a result, Morocco and Jordan have engaged more in a process of reform with some subsidy. Within the Gulf states, there's a lot of variation in the amount of reform. Kuwait is engaged in a variety of governance experiments that are of interest. Um, and, and so, by, by no means would I treat the GCC as a block any more than, say, you know, Jordan and Morocco should be, you know, grouped together as non-oil-rich monarchies. The reality is there's a very diverse set of governance conditions and population conditions, far more so than if you, you know, you make the obvious comparison to Hungary, Bulgaria, whoa, uh, Eastern Europe in the 1990s, it's a far more uh, diverse and complex uh, uh, set of regimes and set of population needs, and that means it's, it's going to be a long process. Okay. Will we do another round, or that's it? Okay, so um, thank you very much, Randall. Thank you. Um, that was uh, interesting uh, and also uh, opened uh, up for some ideas and challenging ideas, so uh, we're always uh, happy to host uh, such talks and debates in the Institute. Um, on the subject of uh, the solid waste uh, uh, crisis in, in Beirut and Lebanon, we're hosting a panel on Tuesday, um, and we're hosting members who were served in the ministerial committee, but also some critiques of the new uh, uh, proposal by Minister Shuhayeb. So if you're interested in the subject, from the solid waste management perspective, but also from the political perspective, be here on Tuesday at 11 a.m. And also we'll try to live tweet it, stream, live streaming, and all the lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.